Okay, welcome to part two of the lecture. So now that we have some, some historical background, let's turn to Anambhata's primer on um, reasoning. So we've, we've said that he's part of the group of Nyaya philosophers that we've seen before in PPT 1. All right, so uh, Nyaya philosophers are part of Brahminical or Vedic thought, uh, which is a tradition that takes seriously texts like the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and then, of course, we've read the Nyaya Sutra and some commentators on that. So that's Nyaya. They're part of this broad tradition. And Anambhata lives in the 17th century, as we've said. So we want to remember that even though there are both uh, groups of Indian philosophers, Buddhists, such as those represented by the questions of King Belinda, uh, they are in um, opposition to the Nyaya philosophers. Buddhists and the Brahminical thinkers have some significant disagreements. And we will read another Indian philosopher um, named Shantideva, a Buddhist in this course, but he lives much earlier than Anambhata in the 7th to 8th century. Okay, so just to keep, keep track of who, who is whom. So we don't know much about the life of Anambhata apart from the fact that he lived for a time in Varanasi, probably though he was born in the south of India. We do know that he wrote works other than the Primer on Reasoning, or uh, really it's called the Primer on Objects Known by Reasoning, as he explains in the text. We'll talk about those objects in a minute. Now, in keeping with the sort of interdisciplinary nature of 17th century Indian thought, Anambhata didn't just write on Nyaya philosophy, but he also wrote commentaries on other philosophical traditions, and he wrote works of grammar. But this, this is really by far his most popular work, this primer on reasoning. It would have been read by school students, uh, the ones that I mentioned earlier, the people who were just beginning their courses of study along with a teacher. Um, they would have read this along with other textbooks on schools of thought common at the time. So this work is basically a series of verses, and then the author writing a commentary on those verses. And this, this commentary is the Deepika, or the illumination on the primer. So the excerpt that you have includes selections from both the verses as well as the expanded uh, illumination. So in order to orient you to the expert excerpt that you have, let's start with the widest context and work our way into the discussion on inference. Okay, so let's let's go back for just a second here. Okay, so one of the first things that you might want to do to understand a text is to look at the title. We already know that this is an introduction to Nyaya philosophy. The title, however, emphasizes reasoning. So we might think that the focus of the book is epistemology or logic. However, Anambhata himself explains precisely what his purpose in writing this book is, as well as what the title means. He says that the word reasoning, or tarka, is really meant to include also the categories of things that one reasons about. So patterns of reasoning isn't the entire focus, independent of also our having knowledge about the world and what the world is like. As we saw earlier for Nyaya, the goal in our thinking is to attain the highest good. So this means we're coming to know about the world uh, not just sort of um, on its own, but as value-laden, independent, not independent of uh, ethics and, and human concerns. So there's a goal worth pursuing in the world. And one thing that I really want to emphasize is that Anambhata is not writing a uh, formal logic text. So, for one reason, uh, we'll see that he's concerned with more than just abstracted patterns of reasoning. He's concerned with the psychological processes of human beings. He wants to know the causes that ground, that underpin genuine knowledge, and, and the causes of obstacles to it. So we might call this a cognitive phenomenology, which is a fancy contemporary term, basically for understanding the character of our mental life. Anambhata is interested in what it's like to pull all of the pieces together in an inference, what's psychologically necessary and what's necessary in our relationship with the outside world for coming to have knowledge. And at the same time, there are patterns of reasoning that he identifies. Uh, and so we might want to abstract these patterns from a discussion of a particular person who has an inference at a particular time. So while Anambhata's goal is to explain how human beings like you and me come to have knowledge and how we cause other people to also have that knowledge to share in it, he's describing regularities which we might be able to understand in terms of things like logic that, that we're familiar with in the contemporary world. Okay, now even though we're not reading the entire text, you might want to know a little bit about where in the book we're at. Right? Often textbooks have chapters which build on each other, although sometimes you can just dive into one section. In this case, the discussion of inference comes after Anambhata has discussed the categories of things which exist, which we can perceive. 
So let's look at some of these categories. And we're going to use a common example used uh, in Nyaya philosophy, a cow. So let's, let's name this cow Bessie. Okay, the first major category of things that exist for Anambutta is substance. And that's whatever it is that Bessie, this particular cow, is made of. According to Nyaya philosophers, the composite world of stuff is made up of fundamental, indivisible atoms whose characteristics are defined in terms of how they relate between the, the external world and our senses. So atoms are conceived of, of, as being earth, water, air, fire, and something known as space or ether. Now, that may seem rather primitive, especially for the 17th century. However, we want to remember that their focus is on how the world is perceived by our senses. So substances uh, are defined by being made up of indivisible atoms that our senses can make contact with. So earth is whatever stuff, whatever substance has the property of being able to be smelled. Uh, the substance of fire is whatever stuff has the property of being hot to the touch. Ether is whatever stuff has the property of being audible. And, and these properties will be important to you as you come to some of the examples in the text. So th this is the idea here with these substance categories. The second category we'll talk about today is quality. Another word for quality is property, if you want to use that as well. So let's start with an example. Bessie has the quality or the property of being white and black. She is a white and black cow. What other qualities does she have? Well, she is not just a white and black cow. She's a four-legged cow. She is a living cow, at least the actual Bessie is. She's a cow who has a dewlap, right? All of these uh, qualities or properties are things that we can say Bessie has. Now, it's because of our observation of these qualities that we can say, ah, Bessie is a cow. Animals with a dewlap, with uh, horns or four legs and who eat grass, they're cows. But it isn't the dewlap itself that makes Bessie a cow, nor is it her having four legs. Rather, for Nyaya, these qualities give us evidence that Bessie has a special relationship to something known as a universal. Universals are our third category. A universal is the thing which makes Bessie, this particular cow, able to be categorized along with Daisy and Gracie and other cows in the field with her. So we can talk about the universal as being cowhood, as long as we remember that cowhood is not something that lives in some kind of out there uh, ethereal heaven, uh, but it's something which is connected with particular things. Uh, a universal is something that all cows have, uh, but there's only one universal. That's the universal of cowhood. Okay, so what we can say about Bessie is that she is a particular thing. She has the properties, the qualities of being white and black, and she is a cow because she has inherent in her the universal of cowhood. Now, before we get to the discussion of inference itself, we want to note that Anambutta has already begun a discussion of what he's calling epistemic instruments, or ways of knowing, with perception. And this is because inference is just one of several ways of knowing or epistemic instruments that Anambutta discusses. So an epistemic instrument is a psychological process which is truth conducive under the right conditions. So let me say that again in another way, a little, a little differently. Uh, an epistemic instrument or a way of knowing is a way in which human beings come to have true beliefs when their psychology is working correctly and they are in the right environment. For instance, perception is an epistemic instrument when I'm in ordinary lighting conditions and I haven't had any weird hallucinogens slipped into my food. My seeing you all in front of me, or if I were in the, uh, in the, the room giving a lecture, my seeing all of you in front of me would cause me to know that you all are in front of me. Right, right now I'm looking at my laptop and my uh, seeing of the laptop, the laptop causes me to, to know that there's a laptop in front of me. Uh, and that's when there's an, the right kind of lighting situation and I haven't had any uh, weird things slipped into my food or uh, my, my glasses aren't all, all fuzzy. So inference is a way of knowing in a, in a similar, similar way. So my proceeding through the right set of mental steps will cause me to have knowledge. But the thing is, like perception for inference, I need to make sure I'm in the right kind of situation, that my cognitive state is good. But when everything is in place, as a result of inference, I'll have knowledge. So Anambutta defines knowledge 
as the cognition which causes all ordinary behavior. It's a mental event. It's like having a belief. It's something that a person experiences at a particular time and place. And a cognition is of something. So I have a cognition through perception that Bessie is white and black, or that she moves. And for, for Nyaya philosophers, when my cognition, like that Bessie is white, is caused in the right way, then I have knowledge. Okay, um, and because I've had the cognition that Bessie is white and black in the right kind of way, then I can be confident that I can act based on it. I can, I can do the right thing when someone says, get me the white and black cow. So the connection between knowledge and action is really important. Perception is the most primary, fundamental source of knowledge for the Nyaya philosophers. Ordinary perception lets me have knowledge of Bessie through my seeing her, hearing her moo, touching her skin, you know, smelling her cow odor, which, you know, maybe not super pleasant in the field. Um, but all those things are, are the kinds of things that a perception can give us. And we'll see that, that inference requires perceptual input in order to work. So through perception, I have contact then with the cow particular, Bessie the particular cow. I have contact with the whiteness, the quality of white and black in her. And I can know that the white color that I am seeing is a color because of its having a connection to uh, the idea, the concept of color. So this is what he's talking about in the first section when he's talking about perception. We are able to, as he says in this quote, for instance, if I'm looking at a pot, when perception of a pot occurs by eyesight, the connection is contact. When perception of the pot's color occurs, the connection is inherence in something contacted. So I can look at the, uh, the cow by my eyesight, and I have contact with Bessie the cow. When I have contact um, with Bessie the cow, she's colored white and black. And well, what kind of contact am I having? I'm having contact with something that is inherent in the thing contacted. The, the, the white color is inherent in Bessie. So the white color inheres in Bessie, which has been contacted by my eyesight. But then I can say, oh, wait, Bessie is a colored thing in general. And that's because in the white property, the, the, in those white bits, uh, in the white quality, there is colored in general, colored nature, right? White is a color. So more generally than just that particular bit of white, there is being colored, and that inheres in color. And because there's that in the white bit, which is in Bessie, when I see Bessie, I can also know through perception that Bessie the cow is a colored thing. So the idea here, and if you look at the diagram in the slide, you can see because I have contact through perception with Bessie the cow, I can then have contact with all of these other real properties, real things which are connected in Bessie. And if I can have this kind of connection through perception, then I can use perception to help me infer, which is what we'll turn to next.